Thanks for coming along tonight, both the new audience here and our Zoom um, followers and those who will watch this on television or some other means later on. Uh, welcome tonight for our discussion with Joe Hildebrand and Warren Mundine on the concept of the voice to arguments. We don't do official debates here, but we do have discussions with people presenting different points of view, and that's what we'll have tonight. So we're going to lead off with Joe Hildebrand. He's well known as a Daily Telegraph columnist, as a Sky News contributor, and as a presenter on occasions on, and a commentator on other occasions on uh, 2GB in Sydney. And uh, Warren Mundine is very well known, but I'll introduce him as Director of the Indigenous Forum at the Centre for Independent Studies and Chairman and Managing Director of the, how do I pronounce that, Warren? Plaque Group. How do I pronounce it? Oh, yeah. He says his CV's four pages on, he doesn't know what's in it. <laughs> CEO and Chairman. CEO and Chairman, yeah, okay, all right. Um, and so we'll commence with Joe and then we'll go to Warren and then we'll go to questions and discussion. Joe, you're very welcome. Who makes a, a welcome first appearance at the Institute. Warren's been here on a number of occasions. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Jared. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I have been here um, before, but in a spectator's capacity, so it's um, lovely to experience it on this side of the microphone. Um, it's, I'm glad it's not a knockdown, drag out debate because, as you can probably already guess, Warren and I are extremely good friends. I absolutely love the man, and he loves me even more. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and that's right. <laughs> and... Um, we actually agree with each other on virtually everything to do with uh, Indigenous affairs, and I'll come to the sort of where perhaps we differ on the voice um, very shortly. I would just uh, like to acknowledge, no, not that, but the um, the fact that it is deeply ironic that you have a white fella up here arguing for the voice and a black fella is about to argue against it. Um, I would also note that, um, as a lot of you will know, Jared is Warren's father-in-law, so I'm already, I think, at a great advantage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I suppose, getting back to sort of, I suppose, first principles and why the need for a voice, why, um, why I think it will be uh, effective or at least is worth a shot. And, and again, I think Warren and I see the problems almost exactly the same way. Uh, I think we just see what the voice would be or could be very differently. Um, obviously, there was uh, a debate launched by Prime Minister Tony Abbott with support of the Labor Party. Uh, about constitutional recognition. Indeed, it wasn't even a debate. It was a push. Tony Abbott was for constitutional recognition. And uh, that process led to the Uluru Statement from the heart. And long story short, when we asked Indigenous Australians what they wanted in terms of constitutional recognition, they didn't really give us the answer we wanted them to give us. They said, we want a voice to Parliament. And I, I think a lot of people, Malcolm Turnbull and said, hang on a minute, that wasn't part of the d discussion, that wasn't in the brief. We, we were just going to put a nice little flowery form of words in the Constitution and that was meant to be enough. So the first dilemma, I suppose, you get when it comes to the voice is you can't consult with people, ask Indigenous people what they want, and then when they come back with something different to what you're expecting, say, oh, no, sorry, you can't have that. So it's kind of, it's a bit like Henry Ford, you know, you can have any colour as long as it's black. Um, so I think that is the first thing. So you have to acknowledge that this is something that they have asked for and that they wanted after a process that was launched by a former Prime Minister who I think most of us um, very much respect, even if he, of course, doesn't uh, support the voice in this form either. Um, so that, that, is the, that is the first thing. So there has been a process, uh, whether you supported the process or not, it was a process initiated by a Conservative PM and it produced a result after years and years and years of consultation and that is what... Indigenous people on the whole want. Obviously, they're not a monolithic uh, group and it would be outrageously racist to suggest that all Indigenous people thought the same way or supported the voice. Clearly, they don't, but that was what the process produced. Um, I initially did share some concerns about the voice being a third chamber, um, but I have had those concerns utterly... Um, uh, the, the, they've been utterly disabused of me. Um, the, the voice will be... Um, if anything, uh, it, it's deliberately designed to be powerless, as we know, the form of words, um, or powerless in terms of legislative power, uh, the form of words that's already been put out there might not be the final form of words, uh, that it will be an advisory body only and that parliament will be in all ways sovereign. And I'll maybe come back to a form of words that could help make that even clearer later on. But um, 
the more I've thought about it and the more I've been involved uh, in the campaign or spoken to the people who are uh, directly involved in the campaign, I've actually come to realise that we, I, whoever, we were the fools in the first place. We were the fools when we were talking about just having constitutional recognition and that being enough. And again, if you look at the situation, which I'm sure is front of mind for anyone on this issue right now, look at the situation in Alice Springs, which I'm uh, very familiar with and having been there myself and seen the town camps and also perhaps quite famously been attacked uh, in the streets of Alice Springs. Um, what we asked them to do, what we asked Indigenous people to do, was to actually come up with something that was, in fact, entirely symbolic, that was, in fact, the ultimate form of foundational virtue signalling in our national document. What they came back with was something that just said, no, there's no point having that unless we have an actual practical instrument that can fix the problems, that can close the gap. I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you um, how big and how chasmic the gap is. I think it's probably one of the widest, if not the widest gap, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people anywhere in the world. Life expectancy alone uh, is about 10 years or so. Um, uh, we also know that we throw enormous amounts of money on this problem, as Warren rightly uh, observed on Q&A a few years ago, and people couldn't believe it. They actually, someone, you know, the dirty little hipsters tried to fact-check him, and he was absolutely correct. I think, was, was it $33 billion, the yeah. figure that was put around? Now, that is a huge amount of money, and if you're spending that amount of money and not only is the gap not narrowing but in many cases widening, then clearly whatever we are doing at the moment isn't working. So, there's, so just from the outset, I suppose, there's, a, there's about three major things there. One, this is what the process produced and what was asked for. Two, it actually is a practical solution. Now, whether it works or not and whether it's a silver bullet, I don't think anyone's expecting a a silver bullet that will fix all the problems at once. But they have asked for no, not just symbolism, but practical action. And, uh, and three, of course, what we are doing now simply isn't working. And again, Alice Springs is proof of that. Um, Alice Springs, and, and again, you can say, well, they shouldn't have lifted the booze bans. I think that's perfectly legitimate in terms of the acute crisis they're facing. Yes, we should send in the army. Okay, again, perfectly legitimate in terms of the acute crisis, the kids roaming the streets, looking for fights, attacking people, attacking property, because it's actually safer on the streets than it is at home. And if you'd seen some of these homes, you could see that with your own eyes. Um, and yes, that does need an acute response. No form of words, no advisory body is going to fix what's happening in Alice Springs right now. But the idea that sending in the army is a long-term solution for any Australian community, even one as crisis-plagued as some of the remote communities and town camps in uh, in remote and regional Australia. It's clearly not a long-term solution. Saying that you're banned from drinking alcohol, you're banned from even having alcohol in your town, in your community, forever and ever and ever, that is clearly not a long-term solution because you're very quickly getting into a situation where there are, in fact, two different rules for two different types of Australian. And that gets to the, the argument where people say, oh, the voice will just create a racial divide or it will create two sets of rights for two sets of people in Australia based on race. That divide is already there. And again, you can see it in the news in Alice Springs. You can see it in the fact that Aboriginal people died 10 years earlier on average than the rest of us. So the idea that the voice would create a racial divide, there's already a racial divide in Australia that is far, far more profound and far more literally vital and deadly at the same time than anything the voice uh, could or couldn't be. So again, far from um, what's happening in Alice Springs being an argument against the creation of a voice. So what are we talking about a voice for when we should be talking about what's happening in Alice Springs? Well, surely that is proof that what we are doing now is not working and that we need to try something else. If anyone has any better ideas, I'm all for it. But that is the one idea that has come forward after exhaustive consultation with Indigenous people themselves. Um, the other thing I would say, sorry about that, uh, the other thing I would say uh, would be uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, Indigenous people have to take responsibility for their communities. They have to take responsibility for what's happening in their communities. I have, I've been accused of all, everything under the sun. And, and again, uh, I've been accused of being a horrendous racist, for example, for pointing out the outrageously high domestic violence rates in Indigenous communities, especially in remote and regional Australia, where you have hospitalisation rates for Indigenous women in some areas 
30 times, 30 times higher than non-Indigenous women. I believe in one area it was actually something like 80 times higher in one particular place in WA, I think it was from memory. Um, so to pretend that there isn't a problem specific to these communities is simply to ignore the facts, simply to ignore the stats, not stats as presented by activists. Ironically, one of the great, I don't know how this has actually managed to happen, but one of the great disgraceful metamorphoses of the what I call the new left, or you might call it the woke left, has been to say that even to raise questions or concerns about the disadvantage that Indigenous people suffer is racist. That apparently the non-racist thing to do is to just set back, let the women and children die and blame it all on colonialism and white oppression and white power. Well, why don't we accept that view? Why don't we actually say, all right, fine. If it's all racism, if it's all colonialism, if it's all white people making bad decisions for black people's lives, over to you. You tell us the solution. We will consult you on these laws. And obviously it will be a matter, while there will be no legislative binding or constitutionally binding requirement to follow that advice, there will obviously be a moral imperative. I think the Prime Minister said it would be a brave government that didn't do it. More importantly, it will all be out there in the domain. So that the suggestions made by The Voice clearly will be on the public record, in the public domain, they will hopefully be coming from people in those town camps in Alice Springs, from the aunties in Wilcannia, instead of the activists on Twitter, instead of the activists on university campuses who blame everything on, you know, again, neocolonialism or intersectional theory, whatever. We say, right, we'll go to you. We'll go to you, people on the ground. The ones, I mean, it's the people on the ground in Alice Springs, for example. They're the voice that hasn't been heard. They are the people who this body is attempting to get representation from instead of the usual suspects in the corridors of Canberra or in university tutorial rooms. So speak to them, ask them what the problem is, ask them what they think the solution is. If it's ridiculous, the parliament doesn't have to do it. If it's something that no one's thought of before and that could actually work, okay, we'll give it a go. But if it doesn't work... Well, that is that responsibility that people talk about. Say, all right, well, you you want self-determination or you want, you know, we say take responsibility for your own communities. You can't very much say that while at the same time saying, but we're not going to give you any instrument with which to do that. And indeed, and again, if anyone has been to any of these communities, the idea that people should just, you know, just stop drinking or stop sending your kids to, or send your kids to school or, that, you know, or just stop hitting your wife, I mean... It's, they, these are communities in a complete breakdown. And, again, I have seen them. I have been on a school run. Um, I, have, I, mean, I mean, even just the fact of parents having... The reason I was on the school run is because there's a bus that goes around all the local camps to take all the kids to school because all the cars are on bricks in the front yard. There's no, and that's, you know, there's one car on brick for about four different families. So, again, there is simply not the um, physical, and for all the money and the resources we throw at it, there is simply not the, the physical infrastructure, let alone the broader infrastructure, uh, the jobs, the schooling. I mean, once, once, the, once these kids get to school, that think, things, are, things are happening in schools that are incredible to help retain the kids, including feeding them, clothing them, providing all their needs, providing incentives to show up. But again, th- these are communities on a knife edge. So we need to do something to fix the problem Nothing we have done so far has worked. This is what Indigenous people have told us they want and they need and they've asked for a practical solution instead of a symbolic one. As Donald Trump said to the black voters of America, what have you got to lose? Vote for me. It couldn't get any worse because under all the people who said they had your interests at heart, your lot in life has actually gotten worse. And that, that's what's happening here. And, yes, there are, of course, historical wrongs. I don't deny that. There have been complete screw-ups in the past. I don't deny that. And there have been well-intentioned policies that have failed spectacularly. There is no question of any of that. But the point is either we keep doing what we're doing and expecting a different result, which is Einstein's definition of insanity, or we say, all right, we've tried everything in our wheelhouse, everything we can think of, everything our institutions use. It works, you know, it might work for every other avenue of society, every other branch, every other community, but it's not working here. You're the ones living here. What do you think we should do? And if they tell us and it works, we win. And if they tell us and it doesn't work, well, the parliament has the capacity to try something else or indeed to ignore that advice and try something else anyway or indeed the capacity 
to reconstitute or tweak the voice. And my suggestion to allay concerns that the voice would be enshrining a racial divide in the constitution, which to some extent already exists anyway, because the previous referendum, ironically enough, gave the the, the Commonwealth the power to make laws for um, Indigenous people in particular. Um, so, and that was one of the great victories. Ninety percent of us or more voted for that. So, uh, that racial divide again exists in the constitution already, or that racial uh, specif specification. It sounds like Terran Rudd. Um, but you could just simply have a catch-all phrase in the voice that would say, and, uh, and the parliament shall have the power to dissolve and reconstitute the voice. In other words, that if it gets bedeviled by corruption, as that sick dig, the parliament can say, right, you lot, you're all fired and we're going to hold a fresh set of elections or we're going to tweak the way that the, the, the body is made up uh, and, then, and then run it again and see if that works uh, or indeed treat the, the, you know, change the level of representation. And that again goes to the problems of, I mean, there, there seems to be a weird parallel argument that's being run against it, which is that it's dangerous to have the voice enshrined in the constitution, but if we do enshrine it in the constitution, we have to have a really specifically detailed version of the voice set in the constitution. And that, again, that those two arguments actually cancel each other out, even though they're being run in, in tandem by the same people. What you actually want, and the, the beauty of the Australian constitution is it's an incredibly flexible document unlike the American constitution, it just provides a sort of skeleton. It basically says, here's how you elect a parliament, here's how you elect a senate, here's how you elect a house of reps, and then you just let them figure it out. And then they can do what they want and they can sort it out. That's why we don't have a prime minister in our constitution, for example. Um, what we have is an incredibly stable system of government that has evolved out of a document that was made to be deliberately flexible and deliberately able to change or del deliberately able to allow the government to change as needs and times required and that is exactly what the voice can and should be as well so you actually want it to be something that can be changed by the parliament of the day and therefore indirectly the people of the day uh, to, to make sure that it works and make sure it does what it is supposed to do and i think that's probably my time thank you very much thanks very much joe so we've got warren thanks warren As, um, as <clears throat> what's your name again? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> as Joe said, we are good friends, and and of course after this uh, after this function, he, he's such a good friend. He's going to take me down to the uh, the the whiskey bar, and we'll have a few bottles paid yeah, by you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, it, it is ironic too, as as uh, uh, Joe says that you know he got this white fella. Who's standing up here for it, and I'm against it in it. But when when you actually start looking back through the history and the constitutional history of of um, of Australia and the relationship between Aboriginals and the wider Australia, we have been on a journey for a number of years, and that goes right back to um, to colonisation, right through to uh, the setting up of the Commonwealth in 1901. And then as you, as you go through that history, you start to see where the Australian uh, nation was heading, and especially after the Second World War, about where it was heading. Before, when you get the early, the late colonial period and the setting up of the, of the Commonwealth, yes, it was an interesting uh, uh, gymnastic way of actually dealing with Aboriginal people. Because one of the things that said in the Constitution was that if you've got voting rights at the state level, uh, you've got voting rights at the Commonwealth level. And that was a bit strange because when they had the first election, there were Aboriginal women in South Australia who had voting rights because in South Australia women had voting rights. In the rest of Australia, women didn't have that voting right. So the good thing that happened there, it actually, uh, women got, you know, and I never argue with a woman, they got pretty cheesed off. And so they said, well, how come they're voting there but we can't? So that was the changes within the Electoral Act in regard to, uh, you know, that getting, uh, you know, getting women to vote. So we, we were one of the first nation, nations in the world to, to achieve that. And America and, and, the, and the UK did it decades later. As a society, we can't go past our history. We should always recognise our history. We should always talk about our history because I'm a great believer in 
in history. I'm an amateur historian because I'm not a professional historian. I just love reading about history. I love researching and doing things about history. And when you, uh, uh, we had the interesting situation in Australia that uh, we had a two-tiered system of citizenship rights for people. So if you were born in Western Australia and you were born in the Northern Territory and uh, Queensland you were a, in, in an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you were a second-class citizen. There's no doubt about that. You didn't have voting rights. You, you were put on uh, reserves and that across the country. Uh, the, you, you had very limited rights as, as a whole. And so, but in, when you come to South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales and Tasmania, they, we had a number of rights which Aboriginal people could exercise, like voting rights. You know, my, I'm writing my book, which is, goes at a very reasonable price at every good bookstore. Uh, or you want to go on Amazon online and all that type of stuff, you can do that, a, book, a booktopia. Is that uh, I, we come across in the archives uh, electoral rolls of my grandparents who were voting in 1913. So there's a lot of confusing and a lot of things that overlap in that about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island in Australia's history. So you had this tier, two-tiered system. So I say it's time and geography determine how you were treated. And, and of course, in New South Wales, even we did have voting rights. When you, If you lived on an Aboriginal reserve, no one told you you did. So you were never able to exercise those rights. In fact, they discourage you very much. But we were a very fortunate family living up on a cattle station where we were, had... We were able to exercise those rights as a family. So as we move forward into the after the, to the Second World War, uh, after the Second World War, Aboriginals, uh, you know, before, prior to 1948, it's 1948 and 1949. I'm sure Jared will correct me later. Is that uh, we uh, that Australian citizenship was created? Before that, we were all British subjects, and by that, uh, having that British subject. Uh, stands, we were citizens of this country prior to that. And when the uh, the, the Citizenship Act come in, into control, uh, there was uh, some restrictions put in place for us as Aboriginal people. But that over time shifted and it wasn't, and, and despite what a lot of Labor Party people would think, it wasn't Gough Whitlam who did these reforms, it was the Menzies government. The Menzies government in 1962 gave full voting rights to Aboriginal people in Torres Strait Islanders across Australia, which then forced uh, states like Western Australia, which in 1962 gave full voting rights to Aboriginals, and then uh, the Queenslanders, always the deep north, they always hold out. Any Queenslanders here? They held out to 1965. So when you hear all these myths, uh, and we need to you know, correct us. I say if we're going to talk about our history, we've got to talk about the real history. Uh, 1967 didn't give us voting rights. 1967 didn't give us citizen rights. But what it did do was actually uh, it, it pushed the agenda for equality in Australia, for all Australians, the 67 referendum. So by 1969 and 1970, all racial discrimination laws in this country were gone, kicked out. And any racial discrimination laws against Aboriginals, it's been over 52 years since they've been in place. Uh, what happened from there is it, there had been a, a huge push to deal with, OK, they are full citizens, what are we going to do? And then it was the Gorton government who came into power and they actually gave up Aboriginal... Uh, they set up the Aboriginal uh, studies, which was to get Aboriginals' uh, uh, support into schools and Aboriginals into support into universities. In fact, in 1969, my brother, my older brother, is about 300 years older than me, in 1969, got to go to Macquarie University and do economics. So these things were, uh, were slowly happening. And then we got... Then as we move forward... Uh, the, the school teacher principal's roles had to be changed because they could bar Aboriginal people. And if people know Neville Bonner's story in Lismore, when he turned up to school, he was barred to go to school. And so, and so you start looking through all that history and then you get into more modern times. Uh, and, and I get really 
up, I don't get upset. I just look at people and, and, and just say how stupid they are. Australia is not a racist country. We do have racists in this country like every country in the world has. We have, uh, we have not had a good birth, but name me a country in the world that's had a good birth. Uh, every country in the world, in Europe, Asia, Africa, whatever, have had a horrendous thing. I don't rate a, a, a country by its history. I rate a country how it overcomes its history, forges together and moves forward. Post-Second World War, when a whole lot of migrants come to this country, a huge amount of migrants who come to this country and made a, a huge difference in helping the economy, helping us move forward and doing a great job about that. I went to this Catholic school. I, I was, went to school and I had 39 kids in my class and we probably had 39 different nationalities in that class, except we probably had a lot of Italians. They used to call me Mundini because of the E on the end of my name, which I thought was quite... Good. It was a good pick-up line for women. They thought I was Italian. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, we regress. The, to me, we've put in place since 1973 and even in the 1960s with the uh, coalition government bodies that were to uh, deal with uh, Indigenous affairs and what way should they go and what way they should happen. It was the Whitland government in 73 who set up the National Aboriginal Consultative uh, Conference, Council, sorry, and that was a group of Aboriginals who come in and, and wanted to do things. And then they got a little bit radical. This is what happens when you get a bunch of Aboriginals together and they decided to, to declare their independence. But anyway, so after that they, got, they had to get rid of that committee and they got another one of the national... Uh, uh, Aboriginal conference, and, that, and there's a whole lot of other bodies that come in. You know, about five different bodies have been over the years who have been advisory groups uh, and uh, to government and uh, to the parliament about uh, having, uh, you know, what should we be doing in Indigenous affairs. There's one body, ADSIC, that was an advisory group, but it also was different because it had a, a monetary. Control, so it was able to uh, 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 look at money in that, and then we had you know later groups that did that. The thing I had is thinking about, and, and Joe reminded me of it, was Einstein. He's credited with it. We'll never know if he did say it. Is that uh, you know this thing about doing the same old, same old, uh, waiting for a different uh, outcome? Well, when when you look at it, you've got a a, a committee, they call it the voice, but it's a committee that will be given advice to government and it will be advisory. It won't have any legislative power, won't have any monetary power. Uh, it will just be an advisory group of people. And my first question was, well, wasn't that what we did with the other five committees that we set up over the years or conferences or, or councils as, as you want to do? They were advisory groups. They, uh, except for ADSIC, they had no monetary uh, powers, and but all of them had no legal powers, uh, 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 parliamentary type powers. And so you're putting forward this idea of another committee that is an advisory co committee, uh, which is going to be the same as every other committee. And, but this is going to be better because we say it's going to be better. And... That, right, that started raising alarm bells for me. Then I had a meeting with, uh, I went to the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry where we listened to briefings from um, Tom Kalmer and, and uh, uh, Marcia Langton. And when they started going through this and you've got regions and you've got this and you've got this, I started seeing a huge bureaucracy start forming. You had regional groups uh, you ha and, and they had to have advisors and uh you know, experts, and then you have the, the national group, which needs advisors and experts to, to work with them, and there's going to be 20 of them. And then yesterday, Noel Pearson had an interview on with Patricia Carvelis, and she said that one of the questions that are raised by people is, well, when you're talking about the, uh, the voice, it will only deal with issues dealing with Aboriginals. Well, the first question I, I paused and I said the first question I 
raised, well, what doesn't affect Aboriginals? The citizens of this country. So every law in this country affects Aboriginals like it affects every other citizen in this country. And then, and so, and then, then I, I clicked the pause button off and listened to Noel, and Noel's answer was, well, taxation, uh, other things that affect Aboriginal people. And he started going through the whole lot. And at the end of his, he, he, he finished, I, I was sitting there and I said, oh, well, I'll be buggered. He actually is talking about every legislation. Everything that's coming forward, and if you if you don't believe me, you can go to Patricia Carvellis on on ABC, and I know some of you will, will go in a heart attack trying to push that button, but yeah, you got you got to go there and just listen to it, and that's exactly what he said. It will have a say on everything. So what does that mean for us as a nation? It means what? Legislation is going to come up. It's going to go through the parliamentary process. It's going to go through the for the Aboriginal voice process. And I'm going to be about 92 years old before it's actually completed and the, and the thing goes through. The other thing is I have not seen anything that is going to show us the panacea. In fact, I see the opposite. What I, I work, I've got my own couple of businesses. I work out there. Uh, and I look at the energy industry, I look at the mining industry and a number of other things, and I see the successes that have happened in those areas. A lot of people here in Sydney wouldn't know that the mining industry is the high, second highest employer of Aboriginals in the country. 7,000, in fact, men and women work in the industry. Uh, you've got 2,000 businesses that work within the industry. Uh, you've got a $4 billion economy coming out of that industry and training people. You go and then uh, you, you look at the IPP, which we put in place. Uh, some handsome, good-looking uh, chair of the Prime Minister's Advisory Council thought it all out. Man was, must have been a genius. Uh, anyway, he, we come up with a group of people, we come up with that, where we looked at how we can develop industry and investment into Aboriginal groups. And through that process, uh, we, we set up this idea of setting up a commercial, private, uh, Indigenous businesses. In 2015, 1st of July, there's $6.2 million, $6.2 million going to that business sector. Today, uh, uh, in fact, only just before Christmas, the figure was $6.7 billion industry. It is employment, things are going for the roof. And these, I know from history, looking at history, that the only way that you drag people out of poverty or get people out of poverty is through an economy. It is through a, a jobs. The problem we had in the past was we was always putting the jobs first. We put in the, the cart before, I nearly said the horse before the cart, but the cart before the horse, it's about getting small to medium businesses into regional and remote areas, uh, getting investment into those areas, and that's what lifts people out of poverty and gets kids. It sort of becomes an umbrella because... When you're doing that, you've got to have an educated, skilled workforce, and that's where that comes from. And that's what I've been pushing for years, and uh, we've got a, a good cohort of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people working together, and we've set up uh, investment funds and looking at uh, entrepreneurs, Indigenous entrepreneurs, f and funding their businesses. And these people are going uh, international, and, and they're getting on the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange in Australia, and this is what will make the difference. A bunch of people sitting in Canberra, which we've had for decades, uh, talking about policies and stuff like that, uh, my, me as an Aboriginal person, I just want government to get out of the way. I want them to get out of the way and we can start building our own communities and moving forward from there. And self-determination is, there's nothing more self-determining than an Aboriginal person, Torres Strait Islander person, running their own business, employing people and and making profits. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Joe and Warren for two enlightening talks and for keeping to the time. So we've got till the top of the hour. Um, I should have said at the start that some of you will know we had Senator Andrew Bragg speaking here some time ago about The Liberal Case for the Voice, a book published by Connor Court. And tonight, another book published by Connor Court, Beyond Belief, Rethinking, uh, Rethinking the Voice to Parliament, which is edited by Warren Mundine and Peter Curti. Um, and we've got copies for that 
for sale tonight that's got a number of important... At a reasonable price. At a reasonable price. <laughs> and we also had Warren talking on his book previously as well as tonight, yeah. Um, and it's got a number of very interesting Australians who have putting their view on that. So there are copies of that available and I'm sure Warren and Peter, who's here, will be happy to sign that. And so, so we come to the questions and discussion. Principle is at stake when it comes to changing the constitution. The Whitlam government created a circumstance of sit-down money for one race of people. And I know Warren's talked about this previously, what a disadvantage it was when it was learnt that we didn't have to work anymore, we could sit down. We're now proposing that there should be another form of governance only available to Aboriginal people in this country, not everybody. And it seems to me that that combination, fiscal and governance, sounds very much like separate development in another place that was called apartheid. I think we should be a single country with no special role for any particular racial group. Okay. Uh, Joe, you might respond to that. Sure. Um, yeah, look, I, I would say in, in normal circumstances, um, that is absolutely true um, and absolutely laudable. Um, I don't like the idea of, of two different bodies governing for two different races, and I think that is fundamentally un-Australian and undemocratic. Um, that is not what the voice is, um, firstly. It is, the voice would simply be an advisory body. The Constitution already has powers to, uh, to legislate specifically for one race of people over another. So that already exists in the Constitution. That was one of the things that was voted on in the, the two questions of the 67 referendum. So that's already there and the sky hasn't fallen in. Um, and again, I think there do, there do need to be checks and balances to make sure that whatever is happening uh, with the voice is working and that if it doesn't work, or again, if it gets beset by corruption. Um, the, only, the only thing I would say to the, the ATSIC thing um, is that it was a, a long time, it was a quarter of a century ago that ATSIC was, was sacked and rightly so. But I, I think that's time enough to be able to, to try again. Um, but I, I, I don't... Um, the, sh the short answer is that Ab Aboriginal people and Indigenous groups are consulted on policy all the time already. The problem is that the same faces are being consulted, the same old talking heads are being consulted again and again and again, and every time, you know... 90% of the time, yeah. they blame it on systemic racism or, you know, the intersectional, intersectional oppression or whatever and all this crap. And so if you actually say to... And one of the things I like about The Voice, without sounding too harsh, is that if you say, all right, well, you've got your voice, you can elect your own people, you can have your say, you can tell the government what it should do, and then if that doesn't work, that's on you. You can't blame, you can't blame it on the, the white fella if, if it's a decision that you've made or something that you've done. And it removes that... Um, it removes that sort of fig leaf, I suppose, that often in a city of well, elite, you know, in Indigenous spokespeople, high-profile spokespeople, will hide behind to explain why there are these skyrocketing rates of violence, unemployment, kids not going to school, kids dropping out of school when they do go. I mean, the attendance rates are just abominable. Another round of figures came out just last week. Um, and, and, and again, in, and in particular, just that, that real life or death thing where, where homes aren't safe. So it actually says, all right, over to you, and then, and, and again, it goes back to that being the responsibility that they say they want, the autonomy they say they want. It's got a lot of safeguards because, in fact, it has no power whatsoever, but it will just sort of pull the rug back, I guess. But anyway. oh, good. I agree with everything that Joe said, uh, except for the stuff after he said, hi, I'm Joe Hildebrand. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> The, 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 the systemic problems we have, and, and, and it, look, we know the history, there was racism in the past, there's a whole lot of things, terrible things that happened in the past. Uh, the thing that I focus on now is the, is the last 50 years and how we're moving into the future. Uh, I, the problem we have in, in these areas when you start to segregate different policy areas so, for instance, I always say, I, I say now uh, in, in welfare payments and that uh, unemployment payments and so on, the Australian taxpayer is pretty generous. We, we, it's the Aussie thing. If someone falls on hard times, we'll always help them. We'll always help them get back. Uh, we should avoid race. It should be about need. We need to be focusing on need. You know, and I'm going to do something that doesn't work in my favour here. I don't, I don't need government funding and government help because I'm okay. I'm, I'm a pretty cool guy. I live in the North Shore. And, 
and <laughs> and fly around and have a lot of fun. I've been there. It's a nice joint. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, but keep your swimmers on next time. Anyway, the <laughs> the the thing. Is, so what we got to get, we got to focus on need. If for, people are falling on hard times, we need to work with them on need. The problem we have is also the politics, and some and, and our federation works against it sometimes. Like I, when I was chair of the Prime Minister Indigenous Advisory Council for Turnbull and and Abbott, uh, my, I spent ninety five percent of my day arguing with politicians and bureaucrats from state and territory level, because they're in charge of health, they're in charge of education, all these other areas. We've actually let them off the hook, because they're the ones who're supposed to be getting kids to school. They're the ones who are supposed to be uh, providing health, uh, uh, you know, medical services and all that type of stuff. So, so everyone focuses on uh, post, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gough Whitlam. They always focus on the uh, federal government that fix all these problems. In actual fact, we had no power. I tried to get – I didn't want to know the students' names. I wanted to keep it as a privacy issue. I just wanted to know if there's a community with 100 people in it. If 50 kids turned up on day one and 50 kids turned up on day two, are they the same kids? That's all I wanted to know because we know we've got to have kids continually turning up for school, otherwise education becomes a waste of time. We couldn't even get that data. The states refused to give it to us and we had no power to do anything about it. And so, 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 so we've got to start focusing on what we need to do to make those changes. We need the states, territories and the Commonwealth Government working together on that data to make sure that kids are getting educated and getting to school. And also, it helps us, and this is what we did in one thing, because we sort of just used our power in the Northern Territory about, uh, we, we were able to uh, get uh, community leaders to go to the school, check who's away from school, wasn't in our, able to go and then sit down with the parents and work with those parents about how you get to school. Not punishing them, not taking off their uh, social welfare or whatever it is, it was actually to sit there go, OK, you've got three kids, three of those kids aren't going to school. How can we work with you to get those three kids to school? What is happening in your family to get that happen? We, if that, we're only able to do that in the Northern Territory because they just stopped us uh, in the States from doing that. So, so there's a lot of uh, uh, federation issues we've got to deal with and, there's, and, we, and, and I look, I'm really sick and tired of, of these committees being set up and things failing and that. I just want things done and this is what I do. I go out there and I just get things done. I went into Aracoon. Uh, I saw a bloke who was working on the dole mowing lawns and I, and I saw him a few weeks later. My, I thought, this bloke's a bit of a goer. So I went up to him and said, if I give you 15 grand, we can set you up in a business and we can get you and I'll get a bookkeeper to help you in your tax and everything like that. And you, then you can contract with the local Australia Council, the school, the Commonwealth Government offices, da 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 to do that work. And he did. And that was five years ago and he's still there. He's got a business now. He's got two young blokes working with him and doing things. I just want to see action. I'm just over committees. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've got to... The question that's come from, by Zoom from, from Western Australia. So the Prime Minister, when he made the announcement about six months ago, spoke about the voice engaging in representation. And the question is this, that if um, the voice suggested the introduction of a levy for compensation for living on stolen land and a report went to the Parliament and the Parliament rejected it, in view of the recent establishment of the Pay the Rent campaign, what would the prospects be of any rejection by the Parliament um, if the matter went to the High Court? Now, I know it's a legal question. So the real question is, 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 this, is, is representations from the voice ever likely to go to the High Court, I guess? Uh, you know, as you said, I, I'm not a, a lawyer, uh, but I, I do work with... Uh, you know, lawyers, that's probably why I'm still out of jail. No, <laughs> I do work for, with, well, KCs there now, not uh, Queen's yeah, councillors, yeah. King's councillors and, 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 and a wide range of people and also constitutional lawyers. Uh, where they say, and this is one thing, I, I, that, and there's a differing view, I've got to say, within the legal profession about this. Some people say it's not possible for them to go to the High Court and there are other lawyers who say that, yes, it is possible. They can't see how you can't go to the High Court. How they're going to stop that? So we've got that differing view. Uh, 
that's not going to be resolved until someone actually goes to the well, tries to go to hold to the high court. So the question is, I don't know. I just can only tell you what the two viewpoints are in the legal profession. Yeah, I would simply say that whatever happens, it will be very, very clear in what is written in the Constitution that Parliament is sovereign over the voice and that the voice's advice will be non-binding. So I don't, given the High Court's role in this, in this sense is simply to interpret the Constitution, I don't see how it could interpret that as being the voice can tell the Parliament what to do when the, the, the form of words expressly, or the mooted form of words and whatever it will be, uh, expressly says the exact opposite. So I, I think that's a bit of a... Yeah, look, I do agree with that last bit because the, the lawyers on both sides uh, do it. But if, but if uh, that it does, it, they, they can't be a, a legal chamber. That's, that's, that's all they talk about. A legal chamber is not right. But through other pressures and that, uh, you know, we don't know until someone does it. You know, uh, and that's uh, you know, I'd love to to say yes or no to it, but. I don't know, and I only can take the advice of the lawyers and there's divisions on that. And I know I would love to say, gee, I wish that happened because I could do with a bit few bucks and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Here, we've got to be brief for the government. Yeah, a brief one for Joe. Um, we've known for years and it hasn't been fixed. We've got the same institutions in place, presumably, after The Voice. Why do you think it's going to make any difference? Okay. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think... Well, as you say, we've, we've, the th business as usual clearly is not working. Um, and yes, we do know a lot of the problems. And in a lot of the cases, I mean, Blind Freddy can see a lot of the problems that are going on. And again, these problems are often being obfuscated by the people who are already being consulted on Indigenous issues. And again, these are the sort of people who say that, well, you cannot actually even acknowledge the fact that rates of domestic violence are higher in Indigenous uh, and particularly remote communities. Now, is if you've got someone saying, well, you can't even say that because Indigenous violence knows no boundaries, knows no postcodes, and in fact, it's, domestic violence knows no boundaries, knows no postcodes, it's all about toxic masculinity, it's nothing to do with a particular community, then you're not going to solve the problem because you're simply denying that the problem exists. Now, um, I love to see the price as well. I also love Josephine Cashman. I, in fact, worked with him on a story about a bunch of aunties from Wilcannia who were so frustrated with trying to raise the story of their um, of what was happening in their community, with the usual powers that be, and they were just getting ignored, and they were getting blocked, and they were actually even laughed at by certain trendy inner city indigenous activists, and they end up going to Pauline Hanson because she was the only one who would take them seriously. And of course, what happens then? And I wrote the piece about it. Of course, what happens then? The media ignores it, and everyone just says, "Well, that's just Pauline. Han Anything involving Pauline Hanson well, must be crazy, must be wrong." No one showed up to the press conference. They were right there in Parliament House and no one came. Even NITV, even National Indigenous Television did not cover it. Um, it was absolutely shameful. And again, I got in a blue with them about this, as I tend to do on social media. And so why didn't you even cover it? So, oh, no, it's just pulling hands, blah, blah, blah. Now imagine if they could actually raise those concerns and say, this is what we need to do in a transparent way through a democratically elected body and say, look, this is it. Ignore us now. Defy us now. You smart asses who were laughing at us then, ignore it now. Imagine if, for example, The Voice, Warren, said, we need to know what the attendance records of the schools in these communities are. Imagine if it was The Voice demanding it of that publicly, demanding of that of state and territory and federal governments. Um, instead of just something that was happening behind closed doors. And that, that I think, is the sort of thing... And, and again, maybe I'm ridiculously naive, but, uh, but that is the sort of thing... That is how I imagine the voice operating. I don't imagine it as being another layer of bureaucracy. I imagine it as actually cutting through the bureaucracy that's already there and, and replacing it. There's, there's a lot I agree with on, in what Joe is saying. One of the, and the big thing I do uh, uh, really want to push. We need do, we need transparency in this whole whole process, you know, and, and and of course some people are going to play politics with it, but we but that's just politics. We uh, but we still got to fight for improving people's lives, bringing them into, into the in, you know the better lives, housing, education opportunities, and getting all the opportunities that all Australians enjoy. There's no argument about that. 
And the only way we can get that is through transparency. We saw the problems with with, with ADSIC, and, and I agree with you, there's a whole lot of different Aboriginal people in Torres Strait Islander the people out there now, uh, but we need transparency in the whole system because if we don't get that, then people are then people are going to play fun and games. <laughs> Hi, for both of you. Um, looking back through history, I think this is the most confusing referendum that this country has ever produced. If you go back to the conscription debates, people knew it was either go to war or not go to war without your consent. Go to the 1951 conscription for communist uh, dissolution. The legislation was passed. The legislation was on the table. The um, uh, Republic referendum, we knew the model, and yet they all went down. This one, we don't even know what we're voting for. So how are we going to find out what we're voting for? Because I see, unless we know what we're voting for, there's no chance we'll have a voice. Uh, yeah, look, I, certainly it's fair to say that, that the left, the, the yes campaign hasn't been particularly effective, to say the least, so far. It has been a bit of a dog's breakfast. And I think there has perhaps been a false sense of complacency. They've been looking at the polls and saying, oh, yeah, we've got 60% of people on board. And I don't know if you picked up the paper um, this morning, but that number is going steadily, steadily down as the confusion um, reigns and is allowed to reign. And uh, again, I'm hopelessly naive and optimistic, and I am um, I'm simply um, assuming that the no campaign is already out there on the front foot and is is making um, is raising some really legitimate questions and and raising the concerns and also stirring the possum a bit and that that is the the dominant narrative out there and and the yes campaign simply hasn't begun in earnest and I'm hoping they've got some whiz bang amazing three point document that's going to solve all the problems I wouldn't, I'm not optimistic and naive enough to hold my breath um, but um, but. But I think, look, the simple proposition is um, do you want a voice, an Indigenous voice to Parliament enshrined in the Constitution that can provide advice to the Parliament that will be non-binding and the Parliament will have the job of setting up that voice and have all power over it? So that is the basic... There hasn't been a, a, a definite form of words yet, but that is basically the proposed form of words as to what it might look like. Now, that hasn't been solved particularly well, but that is what it is. And, and for, for people demanding more and more detail, again... Simply say, I mean, if you look at Brexit or something like that, Brexit didn't ask the British people, oh, what should, Bre you know, what should all these tariffs be replaced with or what should the level be or how should we work out our fishing quotas with Denmark or whatever. It just said, do you want to leave the European Union or not? Do you want it or not? So I think there is a case for referendum being simple and establishing what the actual will of the people is and then it, we already have a body to find a way to, to implement that will in a workable fashion and that's the parliament. Getting the end. A very brief response. I'm glad you brought up the Republican one because um, uh, Joe and I belong to a secret society called the Joe Hildebrand Republicans, which are too lazy to campaign for a republic. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the issues, you raise some important issues and this is why I think the Yes campaign are backing off too much information. And, that, and it's one of these things that is... Okay, that's a good political move, and I'm not a, we'll find out when the election's over whether it's a good or bad uh, political move. But I understand why they, why, they, why they're doing that. The problem I have is is uh, I've worked with a lot of these people, and over 35 years, and I know a lot of these people. You know, if someone told me that Albo was going to be prime minister 10 years ago, I'd have locked you up. Um, so I've got to give it to him, and he's done a great job internationally. He's been out there for banging. Uh, banging for Australia. So, but in this response, he, I think it is a mistake because they need to give something because uh, when people are looking at this whole area, they're very, very reluctant to vote for it if they don't have a little bit more of that information uh, in, in regard to that. And also, it's, it's, it's not healthy for them, and this is where, like with, with Facebook banning a simple comment by saying this, it's a privilege in one class of people. Uh, and they said, well, where did you get that from? And, and they go, oh, we got five, uh, one a former chief justice, no, one a former justice of the High Court and four barristers and SCs and, and uh, KCs. And I said, well, that's a bit. And so they all agreed, did they? And I said, and that was how you worked it. And they said, well, I can, I can show you a couple of uh, uh, justices who, uh, former justices who disagree with that. I can find 
several KCs and uh, senior councils who disagree with that. Uh, so when you're getting to that, I, and I made this on, on 730 reporters, I nearly had a heart attack when they rang me and called me up. I'd been on there for 20 years. The, they, um, uh, they said, well, you know, these are very senior people. And I said, well, look, these people I got as very senior people as well. So, so this idea that because of that, they then ban commercials, that, and I'm always a fighter for transparency. It starts to put in my mind, well, what are these people trying to... Not that I'm a conspiracy theorist. Uh, what, 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 is, what are they going to do after this? Yeah. So um, um, I worry about that. And, the, and, and Joe said it earlier, there are Aboriginals who support this and there's Aboriginals who don't support it, but I think the vast majority are sort of sitting in the middle. They haven't really made up their mind yet. But, uh, yeah, but these things don't help in the discussion. You know, I watched. I listened to Ben Fordham the other day. It was a train wreck, and that's probably what affected the polling. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I actually felt sorry for the poor bloke at the end. Uh, 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 you know, Alba, because he just didn't. He just got smashed. So we got to we got to have more transparency and more conversations about it, what about what it is. Otherwise, it's not going to go anywhere. We've got a question. It's going to be very very brief. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we. Basically, my question is, why is um, our Prime Minister denigrating anybody who has a different viewpoint or is asking different questions? Why do you think this is? And so the question is, well, the question yeah. is, is the Prime Minister denigrating people who disagree with him? Have and, it, and being political, in a sense. I'm very quick, like I say, I haven't been aware of the PM actually doing it, but I have been very vocal uh, at some others whose names have been raised uh, here calling people who don't support it racist. I think that is absolutely disgraceful and, and counterproductive. And also the idea that you would just, and, you know, Zali Stegall saying that she would just legislate for it anyway, even if people voted against it. Again, I wrote a piece that published today saying it was just an absolutely disgraceful, destructive condescending, anti-democratic, paternalistic um, shocker of an idea. So, yes, I think that is where the, the yes campaign can sometimes become its own worst enemy. Yeah, look, I agree. I, I agree. Uh, there has been... Uh, look, you should see my social media. I've been called everything under the sun uh, and, and it would make my grandmother blush. But, you know... I, 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 and Albo has, you know, this is a nice thing to say, do, and you've got to vote for it, and it puts it in mind that if you don't vote for it, then you're some sort of redneck and that. I say, I say about the people who have racially abused me and that, I said, you're not a representative of the Yes campaign. I know people who work like Joe and other people who work on the Yes campaign. They're decent, really good people. And this is one of the cons concerns I have, is that we're going to get this argument. We, and we've got to avoid it because it's, it's not true for a start. We're all working here for something that's better for our nation. We just have different views, yeah. and we need to do that. I just want to do one quick question. I just should make a comment as someone chairing this meeting. I'm not aware of the Prime Minister denigrating any people who are opposing the voice. I don't think it's happened, and I've not seen it. Uh, just finally, can we just look at the other side of this? We'll start with um, Joe and end with Warren. What are the, what's the downside of a negative vote? which is certainly possible. Most referendums end up that way in Australia. The polls are not indicating that at the moment, but if that's occurred, what, what are the downsides of that? Very quick responses. Yep. I suppose for my mind, and again, it goes back to that idea of saying, all right, this is your chance. No, no more hiding behind the fig leaf of everyone's against us. We're all oppressed. It's not our fault. There's nothing we can do about it. It's your chance to take responsibility. So my fear is that you have a no vote, and then everything that goes wrong after that, every bad thing that happens, every riot in Alice Springs, everyone just goes, well, that's because you voted down the voice. That's because you voted down the voice. Whereas if the voice gets up and there's this time to say, well, all right, what do we do about it? You seem to think that you have the answers or you know what's happening on it. You tell us what to do. And unless it's a batshit crazy idea, they'll probably do it. So, so again, that's what I think is the, the problem, that it will just end up being a catch-all excuse for everything that goes wrong and, and more shirking responsibility. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, and, but uh, we also must respect the democratic process. I read your article. That was the second best article I read that day. <laughs> <laughs> there was a was genius in the, in the Australian who wrote that day. Too. But the... And that's my concern, and that's why I've made it quite public that if, if the people of Australia want it, I, of course, we can't, we can't have failures anymore. 
uh, and I've made the commitment that I will help and I will work to make it successful, to get things to happen. Because we cannot have this, uh, this continuing argument and, and, and problems going on with Aboriginal communities. I'm just sick and tired of it. Uh, if, if, if it goes, if the, the campaign goes down in flames, uh, then Zali Segels and Emma, and you said it quite eloquently, that that was a stupid comment by them. Terrible, Terrible comment. We must, whatever happens, we must accept yep. the people's voice, so to speak, and in a, in a liberal democracy, that's what we do. Many thanks yeah. to both of you. Uh -huh. um, Thank you. Just before we go, um, copies of the book that Peter Curti and Warren Mundine have edited, uh, Beyond Belief, Rethinking the Voice to Parliament. And it was a great discussion tonight, very lively, very informative. Well done, Joe. Thank you very much, Joe. Well done, Warren. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>